Uh, thank you very much, Professor Smith. Our last speaker is someone that's returning to the Naval War College. Uh, chaplain Arnold Reshnikov is now the command chaplain at the uh, European Command in Stuttgart, but he was also a uh, Naval War College graduate as well as uh, taught an elective here at one time on religion, war, and peace. Uh, chaplain Reshnikov. Thanks. Uh, of course, none of us have a lot of time. I slashed and burned in terms of my story, but you can't get away without one chaplain story if I'm going to speak. And there's a quick story about the uh, man who got $100 too little in uh, his paycheck, and he went to complain, and the paymaster said, well, it's true, but last time you got $100 too much, and you didn't say anything. And he said, well, one mistake I could overlook, but not two in a row. <laughs> and the uh, you know, reason I, uh, I like that is, uh, the War College, we seem to go back and forth at the ethics conference between more personal ethics and what I'd call maybe using military terms, the tactical ethics, uh, or what we're, gonna, what we're talking about here, more strategic and operational ethics, and by that I mean strategy, when to get involved and why, and operational, when you get involved, kind of the rules of uh, conduct. Um, so I want to focus on that. But, uh, you know, there's an old uh, Jewish saying that says, uh, before I start speaking, I'd like to say a few words. And uh, in a way, yesterday was, was all about that, saying the few words to lay the groundwork. So I want to also just say a few words about things that are not strictly ethical, but, but again, lay the groundwork uh, for our ethical discussions. And I hope a lot of these things are just tips of the iceberg. You'll challenge me or we'll talk about it in questions and answers. But first of all, we talked an awful lot about the military culture yesterday. I frankly don't think there is a military culture. I think the best we have are service cultures. And if I, uh, sometimes on a staff, you have a staff culture when you're working together like you come. But when you hear a Marine at the lower level talking about someone in the Air Force, for instance, you wonder if we have anything. And, we, and just to give an example, we have no shared uh, military core values, just service core values. I think that is going to be a more and more ethical challenge to us if we want to operate together. Uh, and the example I use is um, I think the code that has worked the best in the military is the code of conduct for POWs. And just think how ludicrous it would be if we had one for the Navy, one for the Air Force, one for the Army, one for the Marines. Second thing is I think that uh, um, it's really a larger problem because I think we're in a, a state right now where we're trying to figure out what the American culture is going to be. And again, uh, I like core values, although I think our military effort has failed, and again, challenge me, but um, I think that we're at the point where we have to figure out American core values. If that means, how do we respect differences and yet come up with some bottom line? What are the, no uh, kidding, bottom line values that we accept, and then go on from there? Uh, I think we have to do that, and I'd like to propose we go back to the Declaration of Independence and start with life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, whatever that means, and then that's why we had a military, we had a revolution. Within that, try to figure out the role of the military uh, today. In terms of the gap between the two, some people said it's nothing wrong with having a gap. I disagree. I think what they mean is there's nothing wrong with a difference. You know, the, another quick story, I think I have time to throw in one more, about a chicken and a pig uh, walking down the street, and all of a sudden the chicken gets, uh, looks frightened and the pig says, what's the matter? And the chicken points with her wing and there's this big sign on a restaurant, special of the day, ham and eggs. And the pig says, what are you so worried about? All they want from you is a contribution. From me, they want total commitment. <laughs> I absolutely believe that once we put on a uniform and once we take an oath, something changes or we don't get it. And uh, so there has to be a difference and there has to be total commitment ultimate liability, which is different than anyone else in the country, even the police or the fire, because don't forget at some point they'll say let the building burn, and at some point the police say we won't go in, but only the military says acceptable casualties. We'll take 5%, we'll take 10%, we're going. We're a different animal, and we have to grapple with what that means. Educating uh, across those differences as we have less and less veterans is going to be more and more important, absolutely. Uh, and I think that, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm a Vietnam vet, and I remember uh, stories of how we were treated when we came home. And I, and I think at last year's ethics conference, I told the difference between uh, that time and the yellow ribbons and welcome home with Desert Sh Storm Desert Storm, which I didn't go to, but I got the handshakes and I got the welcome home. And it was no accident, but I think we told the story. People saw the face uh, of the military. And again, another very quick story, I remember 
the, when you let the press in, I saw the newsreel where there was an Iraqi uh, soldier uh, uh, surrendering to, to our forces. And the, he looked uh, uh, terribly frightened because, you know, the propaganda was we would kill, uh, you know, all people who surrendered. As a matter of fact, uh, an intel officer in the Marines told me that the propaganda was you couldn't be a Marine unless you qualified by killing a close family member. I checked with the Marines. They said it didn't have to be a close family member. <laughs> but anyway, on this newsreel, the, uh, the American looks at the Iraqi and says, don't worry, no one's going to hurt you. I didn't do it sweetly, it was no... But, but the point got across to Americans that war is not the same as peace, but neither is it totally different, and we don't become animals, we go in. I think it's very, very important. I'm going to skip a, a few other things here. But I think, let me, before I list some basic principles to end my, uh, my few minutes here, let me say I think there are bigger gaps that we have to take seriously if we're going to lay the groundwork. There's a bigger gap between the senior leadership and the rest of the military than we admit. There's a growing gap between the services. And I think there's a, the worst thing is there's a growing gap between the services uh, and America. And, you know, there's a book by Galsworthy, an English uh, writer called Loyalties, where he asks a very hard question, can you have a loyalty that's not automatically a prejudice? Uh, I think the Marines do the best job with core values. Uh, they teach someone, you're now a Marine, you have values. But the uh, cost is that they look at the people who didn't come, become Marines as people without values. And we have to take that very, very seriously. Let me just end uh, with um, some principles that I would say we need to face as we look at the wars uh, in the future. First of all, it was mentioned the Good Samaritan, I, whether you call it beneficence or whether you look at the uh, kind of shared Bible verse, uh, Christians and Jewish Bible, don't stand idly by the blood of your neighbor. I think absolutely there's some responsibility of power. Uh, we have to deal with that. Number two, though, is the idea of capacity, which you can look at the uh, opposite as limitations. Uh, we can't do everything. And that's going to be a danger, because some people say, well, if, why do you do this if you can't do that? Uh, it's like saying to a policeman, if he pulls you over for a speeding ticket, you can't ticket me because you didn't ticket that person. You do what you can, you make a difference, and somehow maybe the scare goes out there, we'll, we'll do something for you. But, but we, we have to decide in terms of strategy, how much capacity we'd like, and then capacity build. Number three is uh, what's called prudence, which is just, you know, we'd like to do it, it's worth doing, but is it worth the cost? Uh, I think that sometimes we've misjudged. I'm a, I was in Beirut when we had the truck bomb in 83, so I, I believe in force protection, but I'll go on record to say that we've overdone force protection. Uh, I think we have to re-examine it. We're at the point where we're having risk uh, avoidance instead of risk management. And I would say that the link between force protection and quality of life and even mission is like the, risk, the tension between uh, law and order and freedom. If you want absolute law and order, you have to give away too many freedoms. When absolute force protection, we have to give away too much in many areas. And again, challenge me, I'll be happy. And before I'd say reluctance, I think we have to go back to the model of uh, the American who's uh, slow to strap on the uh, holster and the gun belt, but eventually there comes a time we have to strap it on, and if we do, we're going to win. And the five is honesty. We've talked about it before. I'd say clarity of mission in terms of uh, what and why, what is our intentions and why are our motives. I know you have a whole semester here where you talk about how easy it is to be dishonest ourselves with our motives or the forces that do it. Um, I think one of our intentions, one of the changes is going to be that even as we go in, we're going to be thinking of the opposite side, kind of an increase in the limited war idea where reconciliation has to be one of the ideas that, that drives some of our decisions. Number six, proportionality. And I would say that uh, um, it's mis misunderstood many times. I hear people talking about proportionality from the old just war theories as if it means you can't use you know, a machine gun if someone just has a slingshot. It has nothing to do with forces against forces. Proportionality is a moral uh, question. How much bad can you do for the sake of good? And I think that that is something that we're going to have to realize. But the other thing is, there's never going to be a time we, can't, we will not do some bad. 
And one of the ethical principles we need to recognize as a nation and as a military is you line up all the alternatives, including doing nothing, and none are perfect, all are morally flawed. We just have to go for the uh, lesser of uh, all evils. Very quickly, the final few, I think there's a changing respect for sovereignty. We're going to have to deal with that. Uh, just as I think in the, my parents' generation or, or before that, it was kind of a sovereignty of a family. Now we know that if there's child abuse going on next door, we intervene. And I think somehow the family of nations is changing as well, partly because the world is getting smaller. You all know the story about the three men in the rowboat, and one is drilling a hole under him, and he tells the others to mind his business because it's under his seat. But the fact is, uh, the world is getting, is getting uh, smaller. And finally, I'll end here, is uh, a healthy fear, a healthy fear of war, and not just in terms of what it does in, in terms of loss of human lives, but also uh, what it does in terms of uh, our humanity. I think that when we talk about military culture in America and, and U.S. culture, we cannot forget that people don't stay in the military forever. They go back, uh, and uh, the people we send back should not just be physically whole, but spiritually whole. We should talk about some spiritual force protection here. And it's interesting, there's an excellent book I'd recommend, Achilles in Vietnam, by a psychiatrist who dealt a lot with veterans with post-traumatic stress uh, disorder. He says the people with the worst cases are not those who saw the worst. They were the ones who saw terrible things and had no moral framework from their command, from their military, with which to deal. So I'll end by saying, I, I know a few people yesterday used the expression, the military uh, trains us to uh, kill people and break things. It was actually an army colonel who once looked at me and said, Chaplain, the military teaches us to kill people and break things. Your job is to keep me from ever liking it. Thank you.